Hi everyone, this is HD Jen. And HD I'm Melinda. And for the next few minutes, we're going to spend some time talking about parliamentary procedure. You may have heard of this as Robert's Rules of Order. Hey Ami, have you ever been to a terrible meeting? Oh, absolutely. They usually run too long, they're disorganized, and people are checked out and spend their whole time on their phones. That's the worst. I've been to meetings that lack a leader, ones where the leader has no control, or the worst is when attendees totally doubt the competence of their leader. Oh, absolutely. So whether you're a meeting attendee or an executive board member, no one wants to be at a bad meeting. Robert's Rules of Order can help you with that. We've been to our fair share of meetings, but we aren't experts in this. And nor do we expect you to be. But if we all have some common language and understanding of how to run a meeting according to some basic rules, things will go more smoothly. All right, and we're going to tell you how it's done. Ami, mean, I think before we get into the specifics, we should probably tell the audience why this is even important. You're right. Using Robert's rules helps maintain order and ensure fairness. I don't know about you, Jen, but I have things to do, so I don't want to waste time. Like we already said, poorly facilitated meetings and in frustration and eventually lead to low attendance because no one wants to sit through them. Mm, this is definitely true. So in plus, running a solid meeting enhances the eboard's leadership credibility. And what executive board member doesn't want that? Right. So you have to think of Robert's rules like a playbook. It tells you what to do and how to do it. And like any good sports playbook, learning all of this takes training and some practice. So just sit there, listen to all of this, and take it in. You can always come back for more if you need a reference. These Roberts rules have some history. Parliamentary procedure was started in ancient Greece and later refined by the English Parliament. This part isn't on the quiz, don't worry about that, but it might be helpful for you to understand the bigger picture. So parliamentary procedure means relating to a law or governing body, and Roberts rules is a type of parliamentary procedure. So Jen, who is this Robert guy? Robert is actually his last name, and he was an army general. This book here on the left is the official book of Robert's rules. It's actually 704 pages. Oh my goodness. Good thing it's not a required reading. Right? So Robert's rules is a big deal. There's over 5 million copies in print, and Robert's rules has become the most popular form of parliamentary procedure. With so many books in print, it may not be a shock that a lot of organizations use Robert's Rules of Order during their meetings, so it will be helpful for you to learn this while you're at Eastern. Maybe one day you'll be on a school board, a homeowners association, city council, or even Congress. Now that we know who made it and who uses it, you still may be wondering, what on earth is Robert's Rules? Formally, it's a body of rules and customs used by a deliberative assembly to govern their meetings. Jen, what the heck is a deliberative assembly? Good question. Basically, it's just a group who's meeting for some purpose. Mm. So, remember this book is 704 pages long, and obviously, we're not going to cover all of that in just a few slides. We're going to miss some of the finer details, but here are the key concepts. When using Robert's rules, someone needs to lead the meeting. There's a hierarchy of people that have roles to play and responsibilities to complete, and usually this person is called the chair or the presiding officer. Even though someone is facilitating the meeting, and that's a key word, notice I didn't say in charge of the meeting. This is because with Robert's rules, everyone is pretty important. Members and the exec board members alike have the right to bring up ideas and have a right to vote. Decisions are made using majority rules. But... Even the people who are in the minority on the decision always get a chance to share their opinions and vote. Right. So during the meeting, in order to keep things on track, the group only makes one decision at a time. You can vote yes or no, but you need to do it before moving on to the next thing. All of these rules means that members get equal treatment. A president can't just decide that they don't like an idea and skip over it. They need to consult the opinion of the group first. We've talked about the president or the chair, so let's talk about the other players in the game. Your leadership council or executive board may have more people than this based on your constitution, but according to Robert's rules, in order to run a meeting, you at minimum need these folks. First up is the chairperson, sometimes called the presiding officer. This isn't necessarily the president, but it could be. The chair is a role, so often it's a president, but if they're sick, the VP or someone else may step up and be the chair for that meeting. The chair is a keeper of order, and it's extra important for them to understand Robert's rules since they are essentially facilitating the meeting and need to make sure everyone else knows the rules too. 
Right. So the chair corrects people who are wrong in using Robert's rules, but minor infractions can essentially be ignored. You don't want to mess with the flow of the meeting. No way. But if it's going to impact the outcome of something, you really do need to address it. Mm. Here's another key point we've touched on already. The chair is a servant to the assembly, not the other way around. It's not a dictatorship. In fact, they really can't make any decisions on their own because the group determines what's going to happen. So if the chair just can't do whatever they want, what can they do? No, they can't do whatever they want. They can call meetings to order on time, of course. They make announcements that members need to know and basically move business along. The chair recognizes members who want to speak as people shouldn't speak without being called on. This keeps things fair and so no one monopolizes the whole meeting. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> The chair also stops people if they are trying to make silly motions that are redundant or insincere by simply saying, this motion is out of order. Maybe with a little less dramatic flair. <laughs> As we said before, everything needs to come to a vote and the chair makes sure this happens. The chair also tells the group when the meeting is over by saying, this meeting is adjourned. The secretary is the keeper of record. Sometimes you may talk about ideas for an event and not need to return to those ideas for another month or so. So the secretary keeps track of all the notes with those little details so when people inevitably forget a month later, you can check back in the minutes. The secretary should also make notes on the big general body meetings as well as the executive board meetings. So Jen, we can't forget the members. Oh, of course not. The members or the assembly or body have the responsibility to show up, participate, and discuss. The members make motions to take some action, more on that in a minute, and show up to the meetings prepared to participate. Sometimes there's a lot of work that needs to get accomplished. Right, like planning a barbecue. So the chair may decide to make some committees, and according to Robert's rules, there's two types of committees. Ad hoc, which are committees for specific projects, like Ami's barbecue, and standing committees, which are permanent year-long committees, like a birthday committee or some sort of social committee. Committees are really helpful to get people involved, increase buy-in, and also reducing the workload of the e-board. Committees meet outside of the general meeting time, and they come back to report what they were told to do, what they've accomplished, and what their results are. So we've met all the people who are involved. Let's take a look at how to actually run the meeting. Okay, so try and follow along here. There's a lot of details coming your way in a second, and it is hard to explain such a big concept. The presentation will be online all year long, so it's totally fine to come back and reference this. To keep things fair, Robert's Rules has a lot of voting, and everything is based on a motion. Basically, a proposal that calls for a vote. We'll talk about this more in a bit. Here on the screen in front of you is a sample order of business, or what we more commonly call the agenda. Every meeting should have an agenda, so people aren't chit-chatting all willy-nilly. It always begins with the chair calling it to order, and it ends with them adjourning it. You probably want to take attendance or have people say their names, especially if new members are present. The chair will say what they're going to talk about today at the meeting, and if anyone else wants to get in on the agenda, or if topics should be tabled for another week, this can be amended then. Technically, because this is all a democracy, the president or chair doesn't have a final say as to what gets talked about at that meeting. They should bring the proposed agenda, but anyone gets to make edits. So if someone wants to talk about an upcoming trip, but it wasn't on the agenda, they would motion for it to be added. Once it's been motioned and voted on, it's binding. You have to discuss it that day. Then the secretary would give a brief synopsis, just the highlights of the last minutes, and someone would motion to accept them. So anyone who missed the last meeting has some idea of what's going on. There's no need to say Liz said this and Eric said that. Just talk about the outcomes. Last week, we decided to spend $100 on pizza and also $500 on a trip to Boston. All of the officers give a report. The treasurer says how much money has been spent and how much is left so members can take, make informed decisions later on. Then any committee reports and you move on to old business. This is essentially stuff you talked about before but maybe didn't resolve. You would do this before you talk about new business or any new ideas and projects to take on. Before the meeting ends, there is always an open floor in case anyone wants to make an announcement. Then the meeting is officially adjourned.
We mentioned a minute ago that the minutes from the previous meeting need to be approved. During that time slot, the chair says, Are there any corrections to the previous minutes? If no one has any edits, the secretary then asks, Is there a motion to approve the minutes? A general member must make a motion to approve the minutes and another general member would second that motion. Once the second to the motion is completed, the secretary then says, This motion is approved. But if someone finds a mistake in the minutes, for example, say the secretary forgot a zero in typing up the minutes, and for your motion of $500 for a bounce house, you really only allocated 50 That is certainly not going to pay the bills. It definitely isn't. So if someone finds that and brings it up, the chair who's leading the vote says, all in favor of approving the minutes with the following change. Then you vote. Then the secretary should go back and actually edit the minutes so that they read correctly and just write in as corrected in the margin. If a motion doesn't pass, it still needs to be recorded in the minutes. The secretary would just say, fail to receive a second, if no one else supports the idea of talking about it. Let's save a little time here and go quickly over the concept of quorum. For more information, go back and listen to the executive board's presentation. Basically, you need to make sure you have enough people present to vote, and then everything is a majority rules. So that's 50% of the voting members plus one. And remember to round up. Let's talk for a second about formal meeting etiquette. Officially, you should stand up at a meeting so that people can hear you and see you when you're speaking. You obviously shouldn't talk when others are speaking because that's just rude, and you wouldn't want to be on your phone during the meeting either. Especially in big meetings and when new people are present, you should say your name and your title if you have one. Remember, people shouldn't speak until they get called on, and technically, everyone gets a chance to speak once before others get a second chance to speak. This allows everyone to get a chance to put their two cents in. If we want to get technical, once you've spoken twice about a particular motion, you're done. So make sure you make your point. Also, the chair doesn't participate in discussion as they wouldn't want their opinion and title to change others' opinions. In a more informal meeting, like an e-board or committee meeting, things are a little more casual. You don't need to stand when you speak and technically motions don't need to be seconded. The limits on the number of times a person can speak disappear and the chair can make motions and vote too. If you're still wondering what a motion is, it's a formal proposal by a member saying what actions the group should take. The motion says who, what, and when. Like we said earlier, to keep things less complicated, we only deal with one motion at a time. Let's say Jen, a member of the theme, wants to propose we carve pumpkins and also have a Thanksgiving potluck. So when I am called upon, I would say, I, Jen O'Neill, move that the theme spends $100 on a pumpkin carving social for October 30th. Before the group can talk about the potluck, we need to finish discussion about the pumpkin social. Making a motion is essentially proposing that a group collectively talks about a topic. In order for that to happen, someone else needs to agree it's a worthy topic and that they second the motion. So I would say, I, Amelinda Vasquez, second this motion. This doesn't necessarily mean that Ami wants to have a pumpkin carving social, but it means that she believes that this topic is worthy of discussion. Thanks, Ami. Once the second happens, the group can officially discuss it. If there's no second, there's no discussion, but it still should be mentioned in the minutes that it was brought up. Once there is a second, the chair says, it was moved and seconded that we spend $100 on a pumpkin carving social on October 30th. Is there any discussion? And then the members can talk. Maybe members want to spend more money, or they think that the money should also be used to buy snacks instead of just pumpkins. The chair calls on people to keep things organized, and whoever made the motion, in this case, Jen, has the right to speak first, since it was her idea. After a few minutes of discussion, the chair calls for a vote and then determines if it carries meaning it got approved, or if the motion is lost, meaning it did not get the majority's approval. Then, the chair continues on to the next item of business. So what if someone thinks we should spend $150 on the pumpkin carving social? The motion needs to be amended. Just could amend the motion so that it should be changed to $150, or maybe that it will be just pumpkin painting, not pumpkin carving. Remember, you have to focus on one thing at a time, so you can only amend the motion that's on the table. You can't just propose a dance instead. I, Jessica McDonald, move to amend the motion by striking out pumpkin carving and insert inserting pumpkin painting. Did you follow along? Jess just amended the motion, so now we are talking about pumpkin painting, not carving. 
She then needs a second, and you basically start again. In voting, you can be for something if you are in favor of it, or vote against the motion if you are opposed to the idea, or abstain from voting, meaning you just aren't participating in the vote. You shouldn't just abstain from something because you're feeling lazy and don't want to raise your hand, or because you don't plan on attending the event yourself. You would really only abstain if you felt like it wasn't fair for you to vote. Say you are planning on buying t-shirts and the vendor you're using is your dad's company. It isn't fair for you to vote because obviously you have a personal interest in the success of your dad's company. Also, it's important to note that technically you can change your mind on your vote all the way up until the time right before the results are announced. As a chair, you can have people vote in a few different ways. You can have them say I or nay collectively and go based on sound, though you can probably guess that this isn't a good idea in tight races. You can have people say their votes aloud, stand up to vote, raise their hands, or use a ballot slip. What if people say silly things or write them on a ballot? Then it doesn't count. Just throw that ballot away. You can also do a roll call where each member votes aloud and asks for absentee ballots in advance from members who are not present. This is good especially for big deal decisions, like apparel designs. Sometimes you can skip the formal vote altogether, but you always need to vote when money is being spent. If you resolve issues through what the rule book calls general consent, you can vote by the absence of objection. Let's say the meeting is running 20 minutes over time and everyone is losing interest. The chair can just say, is there any objection to tabling the debate for next week? If no one objects, the debate can be closed or moved to the next week. Motion carries. But if someone does object, because in Robert's rules, minorities' votes always matter, you do have to sit there and resolve the discussion, usually by coming to a majority rules vote. The chair only gets to vote, make motions, and discuss during committee meetings and executive board meetings, except when the vote is done by ballot and no one will see the chair's vote. They can also vote if the chair's vote is going to make or break a tie on a highly contested issue. So let's say that the members vote for a paintball trip and it's 5 to 5. The chair would be the tiebreaker. Or if the members vote is 5 in favor of going to paintball and 4 against it and the chair is also against it, the chair gets to vote in order to create a tie. If this happens, the motion doesn't carry. It's over because you didn't get the majority in favor. Here is some more lingo so everyone is on the same page. Let's say someone brings up a motion for an event six months from now, and you have a program coming up next week. You might not want to talk about the future programs, but the more pressing ones at hand. Someone can move to lay the motion on the table, or they can move to close the debate, but you need two-thirds of vote to approve that. You can move to postpone a motion to a particular time or postpone it indefinitely. Anyone can also move to recess, meaning take a break, maybe for food or a bathroom break. Or, if someone thinks Robert's rules are being violated, it's important to bring that up, again, to protect the rights of the minority opinion. Just by saying, point of order, you can interrupt the meeting at any time. The chair needs to determine if there was a violation or not, and if they don't know, they can vote on it. Hopefully it doesn't happen, but if someone doesn't like the chair's ruling, they can also appeal this. I, Jen O'Neill, move to close this presentation. No objections here. That was a lot of stuff. This stuff is challenging and definitely overwhelming. Remember, this book is 704 pages, and we just did it in 29 slides. It's important to try your best and look things up when you're in question. Fortunately, because Robert's Rules is so popular, if you search a question online, you can usually find some help. The link for the quiz is online. Please check it out, and remember, you can consult this slideshow at any time if you need to. Good luck. Presentation adjourned.